American Waters third quarter 2023 earnings conference call. As a reminder, this call is being recorded and is also being webcast with an accompanying slide presentation through the company's investor relations website. The audio webcast archive will be available for one year on American Waters investor relations website. I would now like to introduce you to your host for today's call. Aaron Musgrave, Vice President of Investor Relations. Mr. Musgrave, you may begin. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's call. At the end of our prepared remarks, we will open the call for your questions. Let me first go over some safe harbor language. Today, we will be making forward-looking statements that represent our expectations regarding our future performance or other future events. These statements are predictions based on our current expectations, estimates, and assumptions. However, since these statements deal with future events, they are subject to numerous known and unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors that may cause actual results to be materially different from the results indicated or implied by such statements. Additional information regarding these risks, uncertainties, and factors as well as a more detailed analysis of our financials and other important information is provided in the third quarter earnings release and in our September 30th Form 10-Q, each filed yesterday with the SEC. And finally, all statements during this presentation related to earnings and earnings per share refer to diluted earnings and diluted earnings per share. Susan Hardwick, our President and CEO, will share highlights of third quarter and year-to-date results and will comment on our 2024 EPS guidance and longer-term targets. Cheryl Norton, our Executive Vice President and COO, will then discuss our new capital investment plan, including the expected impact of PFAS-related investments, and will conclude with a regulatory update, including our views on customer affordability. John Griffith, our Executive Vice President and CFO, will then discuss our year-to-date financial results in more detail, discuss our acquisition outlook, and we'll close with details behind our 2024 outlook and longer-term goals and our 2024 to 2028 financing plan. After a few final remarks, we'll then close by answering your questions. With that, I'll turn the call over to American Waters President and CEO, Susan Hardwick. Thanks, Aaron, and good morning, everyone. Let's turn to slide five, and I'll start by covering some highlights from the third quarter and year-to-date periods. As we announced yesterday, we delivered strong financial results in the third quarter of 2023, and we're pleased to again reaffirm our 2023 guidance on a weather-normalized basis. Earnings were $1.66 per share for the quarter compared to $1.63 for the same period last year. In the first nine months of 2023, earnings were $4.03 per share compared to $3.70 per share in the same period of 22. The estimated net favorable weather impact year-to-date in 23 is about $0.11 cents per share compared to $0.06 cents per share favorable in 22. These weather normalized results so far in 2023 continue to reflect our strong execution in line with our growth expectations for the year. John will elaborate further on results later. Moving on to some of our other key accomplishments to date in 2023. We have invested $1.8 billion in capital projects year-to-date reflecting great work by our teams responsible for planning and completing these investments. As you will recall, the total capital investment plan for 2023 includes approximately 400 million of acquisitions, including one sizable transaction in Pennsylvania we expect to close in December, and another in Illinois around the end of the year. As you know, we completed an equity issuance of $1.7 billion in March and a $1 billion convertible debt issuance in June. These were the two key priorities of our 2023 financing plan. We were focused on completing these issuances in the first half of the year to reduce market-related pricing risk and overall execution risk, which has served our investors, customers, and our customers well, considering the current market conditions. Turning to slide six, as we roll out our new five-year plan today, we are affirming our long-term targets, including 7 to 9% EPS and dividend compounded annual growth rates. We are also initiating our 2024 earnings guidance of $5.10 per share to $5.20 per share, which John will discuss further uh, later in the discussion. 
This represents our expectation of 8% EPS growth in 2024 compared to our weather normalized 2023 EPS guidance. One thing to note on this slide is that we have revised the look of our earnings growth outlook. Recall that we'd historically referred to it as our growth triangle. We believe this new version better highlights our compelling 7 to 9% earnings growth expectation and better represents the key drivers of growth. As a nearly 100% regulated water and wastewater utility, rate-based growth and regulatory execution are the key drivers of growth for our company. Rate-based growth continues to be driven by the accelerated CapEx plan we put forth two years ago and now with this updated plan. Combined with our robust regulated acquisition strategy on which we've proven we can execute, we continue to expect 8 to 9% rate-based growth over the next decade. Later, Cheryl will review the amount of capital we expect to spend over the next five years, including related to acquisitions. On this slide, you can see we are highlighting our acquisition growth strategy measured by a compounded annual growth rate in customer connections of 2%. The timing of closing on acquisitions is often difficult to control within a calendar year, which can cause volatility in acquisition investment on a year-to-year basis. This 2% customer additions CAGR target should be an easier way for investors to monitor and measure our growth through acquisitions. And as I said, rate-based growth, which includes acquisition investment, is the key driver to earnings growth. Our growth outlook also includes the organic revenue growth opportunities we expect from our military services group from the 18 installations we currently serve with an added upside for any new bases secured. One of our company's competitive advantages is its diverse regulated operations across 14 states that provides us with flexibility in the timing of rate cases and capital deployment. We also have a very predictable and controllable set of capital projects annually, almost half of which are recoverable through infrastructure mechanisms. Along with our other regulatory approaches, we are confident we can deliver consistent earnings growth and dividend growth over the next five years and beyond. While utility stocks, including ours, have seen the impact on the short term of higher interest rates, history has shown that over medium and longer term horizons, the utility sector, and certainly American Water, has delivered compelling value to investors. We believe the combination of our EPS and dividend growth, supported by our significant yet low-risk capital investment plan and our focus on customer affordability and ESG leadership, will continue to be rewarded by investors. Based on this long-term plan and our history of executing on our strategies, we intend to continue to deliver a very competitive, sustainable shareholder return for many years to come. With that, let me turn it over to Cheryl to talk more about our capital investment plan and our focus on customer affordability and regulatory execution. Cheryl? Thanks, Susan, and good morning, everyone. Before I jump into a discussion of our current long-term capital plan, starting on slide eight, I want to first acknowledge that our teams have done a great job executing on our accelerated capital investment plans these last few years. We have consistently met our capital deployment goal and we're on pace to do it again by meeting our overall capital plan of $2.9 billion this year, which includes acquisition investments. Looking ahead to 2024, we expect a modest increase in our investment spending level to roughly $3.1 billion. Over the next five years, we expect to invest approximately $16 to $17 billion, an increase of about $2 billion over our previous plan. This level of spending reflects the result of our consistent, risk-based project planning. Along with risk, customer affordability is a key variable in our analysis, which I'll speak more about shortly. Looking out over the next decade, we expect to invest $34 to $38 billion in our regulated systems and acquisitions, which is $4 billion higher than the previous 10-year plan. In addition to tackling PFAS, we expect the follow-on capital needs related to acquisitions to continue to increase over time and modestly higher costs for pipe and other capital goods over time. Continuing on slide nine, the increase in the five-year capital plan is primarily driven by three needs. First, the plan includes approximately $1 billion of needed investment to treat water for PFAS contamination across our systems. As we've said many times, American Water supports the US EPA's efforts to protect public health by proposing national drinking water standards for PFAS. 
and we believe our company is in a better position than any water utility to remove PFAS at the level that would be required under the rule as proposed. And we've also said the cost to comply will be significant. Roughly $1 billion of capital remains our best estimate based upon the proposed federal EPA rule, which we expect will be finalized in late 2023 or early 2024 without much modification. We expect most of these PFAS-related capital investments to occur, to occur over a three-year period beginning later in 2024, and primarily in our larger states in terms of customers served, like New Jersey as an example. The source water supplies for New Jersey American water that have PFAS contamination includes include large surface water supplies that are more costly to treat than our groundwater sources. And as we've said, granulated activated granular activated carbon or GAC will be the primary treatment method we use for PFAS remediation because it's a proven and more cost-effective treatment option for our systems. However, we're also piloting ion exchange resins along GAC to compare PFAS removal and media performance, which impacts the overall cost of treatment. While much uncertainty exists around the topic of PFAS, including the recovery of related capital and operating costs, we expect constructive outcomes for this important water quality initiative. And we will continue to advocate that the ultimate responsibility for the cleanup of these contaminants should fall to the polluters. We'll also continue to advocate that all water and wastewater utility providers, regardless of ownership, have equal access to any federal and or state funding related to treating PFAS. In addition, we'll continue our efforts to request permanent federal funding for a water and wastewater low-income customer assistance program. The other two drivers of increased CapEx in the 2024-2028 plan are a higher level of spend related to prioritized renewal projects across our footprint, such as for hydrant, pipe, and meter replacement, as well as a higher level of expected follow-on capital related to future acquisitions. Following recent acquisitions, we have continued to experience a higher level of investment need in order to bring water and wastewater systems into regular, regulatory compliance and up to our operating standards, which is driving the higher estimated capital need of $600 million. You can also see that we have deferred $500 million of lower risk projects to later years beyond the five-year plan. We did this as a part of our extensive risk-based project analysis in conjunction with our ongoing affordability analysis. For example, we deferred until later in the 10-year capital plan the replacement of some services and mains where it was determined that they did not pose an immediate risk to service reliability or water quality. Let's turn to slide 10 and I'll cover the latest regulatory activity across our states. Shown in the slide is a summary of our pending general rate cases with some key facts for each. In the appendix, you'll also find some details related to infrastructure charges, as well as a snapshot of the key outcomes from the most recent general rate case in our top 10 states. Our general rate cases in California, Indiana, West Virginia, and Kentucky are all progressing well and as expected. All of these cases, except perhaps California, will most likely be resolved in early 2024. Just yesterday, we filed a general rate case in Virginia, reflecting $110 million in system investments covering May 2023 through April 2025. We're seeking $20 million of additional annual revenue and expect interim rates to go into effect in May of next year. Outside of our general rate cases, as we discussed last quarter, we filed a request as authorized by California's water cost of capital mechanism seeking a 52 basis point increase to our ROE in 2023, which was approved on July 25th, or increasing the return on equity to 9.5%, effective July 31st. We filed a similar request in October for an additional 70 basis point increase to go into effect January 1, 2024, which would bring our ROE to 10.2%. And finally, Related to the customers we have proudly served in the Monterey community for over 100 years, in October, a local entity adopted a resolution enabling it to file an eminent domain lawsuit with respect to the Monterey system assets. This is not a new issue, just the latest chapter in a long-running effort by an entity that, we believe, 
lacks the expertise to own and operate a very complex water distribution system serving these Monterey customers. Bottom line, we believe based upon existing legal precedent, we'll be able to successfully defend against an imminent domain lawsuit if it's filed. You can find more information on this topic in our SEC filings, including this quarter's 10Q. Moving to slide 11, I'll wrap up with a discussion of customer affordability and this new capital investment plan. Using U.S. Census Bureau data specific to the geographies we serve, our research and analysis concluded that projected rising levels of median household income, combined with conservative assumptions around an increasing customer base, would allow us to stay within our target for residential water bills of 1% or less of median household income. One of the most difficult challenges we face in the water and wastewater industry is balancing customer affordability with the magnitude of the system investments that are needed. Thankfully, today our industry and our company are in very good relative positions in term of, terms of affordability or wallet share. At the same time, we realize we must continue to evolve our strategies around rate design and programs to assist our customers who are challenged with affordability. We must also continue our focus on technology, efficiencies of scale, and cost management in order to deliver on customer affordability. Our dual focus on operating efficiency and customer affordability has been a valuable part of our company's DNA for many years. As you know, we've historically used O&M efficiency as one of our benchmark metrics to measure our success at managing costs as we grow the business. In recent years, we've emphasized that revenue growth has been just as impactful to the O&M efficiency metric as managing costs. As we look ahead, we're continuing to evaluate whether this is the best metric by which to judge our effectiveness at managing costs and running an efficient business. More to come on this in 2024. With that, I'll hand it over to John to cover our financial results and plans in further detail. John? Thank you, Cheryl, and good morning, everyone. Turning to slide 13, let me provide a few more details on year-to-date results. The appendix also has details of third quarter EPS, which has many of the same drivers as year-to-date results. Consolidated earnings were $4.03 per share year-to-date, up 33 cents per share compared to the same period in 2022, and up 28 cents per share on a weather normalized basis. Increased revenues were driven by general rate cases we completed in late 2022 and early 2023 in our larger states. These additional revenues are driven by the significant investments we have made and continue to make in our systems. As noted, earnings were higher year to date by an estimated net 11 cents per share as a result of weather in the second and third quarters due to warm and dry conditions, primarily in Missouri, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. This compares to net favorable weather in the third quarter of 2022 of six cents per share, which related mostly to warm and dry and dry conditions in New Jersey. In looking at operating costs, higher pension expense of about 10 cents per share and increased chemical costs of about nine cents per share, including inflationary pressures, are being recovered in large part through higher revenues we proactively sought through the use of forward test years and traditional updates to base cost of service and general rate cases we completed in the last 12 to 18 months. This strategy has limited the bottom line impact of those higher costs in 2023 and is a strategy we are continuing to use in our recently filed and upcoming cases. Supporting our investment growth, depreciation expense increased 17 cents per share and the cost of additional long-term financing increased 28 cents per share primarily related to share count dilution. As I mentioned last quarter, the EPS impact of the higher share count from our equity issuance offsets the avoided interest expense in the current interest rate environment. We expect the impact to be approximately neutral to EPS for the full year as well, based on the current outlook. Turning to slide 14, this graph illustrates that our continued execution on capital investments, both infrastructure projects and acquisitions, are succeeding in growing regulated rate base at a long-term rate of 8 to 9%. Rate base growth, of course, will drive earnings growth. We believe the high degree of visibility to our capital investment plan, combined with the low-risk nature of the plan, uniquely positions American water in the utility sector and is fundamental to our investment thesis. Turning to slide 15, you'll see that we continue to be set up for strong growth through acquisitions. 
we closed on 14 acquisitions totaling $36 million across six states in the first nine months of 2023, which demonstrates our continued ability to close deals in many states. We also had 32 transactions under agreement across 10 states through the end of September, totaling $611 million, two of which we closed in early October, including one in West Virginia for $27 million. This total also includes both the Butler Area Sewer Authority Wastewater System in Pennsylvania and the Granite City Wastewater Treatment Plant in Illinois we previously announced. We expect the Butler acquisition to close later this year in Granite City around year end, pending regulatory approvals for each, and we look forward to serving those customers. Also included in our acquisitions under agreement is the Tallamance and Township Wastewater System in Pennsylvania we expect to purchase for $104 million as announced back in March. We expect to close this acquisition in late 2024 or early 2025, pending final regulatory approval, and we look forward to serving those customers as well. Our outlook for future acquisitions remains very strong, as we expect to have over $250 million of acquisitions under agreement at the end of 2023 after the expected closings of Butler and Granite City. Of course, as we close on transactions, the work to build and refill the acquisition pipeline is continuous. Our pipeline of 1.3 million customer connections is a strong leading indicator that supports this piece of our rate-based growth outlook. On slide 16, we provide some considerations regarding our outlook for 2024 results in our newly established EPS guidance range of $5.10 to $5.20 per share. First, as you would expect, our growth will be driven by capital investment to serve our customers and earning a return on that investment. As we've talked about previously, 2023 is year two of our accelerated CapEx plan following the HOS sale. So we see that ramp up reflected in earnings in 2024, both from base rate increases and infrastructure mechanisms. As a reminder, approximately 45% of our CapEx is recoverable via infrastructure mechanisms, so it's a very meaningful driver of consistent earnings growth for us. Recent regulated acquisitions that are being incorporated into active or just completed rate cases will also drive growth next year. I'd like to note that our military services group does add incrementally to our earnings growth expectation as we have continued to show in our growth outlook. MSG's great work on the 18 military installations it serves has built trust and resulted in the U.S. government allocating additional funds for improvement projects, driving increased revenues. Just as critical to our growth strategy is our ability to prudently manage the operating costs it takes to run the business, which goes to my final point on this slide. Because of our strong culture of operating efficiency and cost management, we expect only modest increases in O&M in 2024. These efforts go to the heart of the customer affordability construct we want to protect, which is closely aligned with the interests of regulators and ultimately investors in managing affordability of customer bills. Finally, related to pension, I'd simply remind you that our pension obligation remeasurement will be done at, at year end 2023, and that will drive the determination of our 2024 pension expense. Turning to slide 17, I'll provide a financing plan update before closing with a look at our balance sheet and liquidity profile. In our prior five-year plan through 2027, we expected a total of $2 billion of equity financing need. We successfully issued $1.7 billion of the $2 billion earlier this year, leaving $300 million of equity financing needed toward the end of that prior plan. Based on our new capital plan, our financing plan now includes an estimated $1 billion of equity issuances from 2024 through 2028. The $1 billion of equity in our new plan is expected to be issued near the middle of the 2024 to 2028 period, subject to market conditions. The $700 million increase in the anticipated external equity need is driven by the incremental $2 billion of CapEx in the new plan. As we've said many times now, we expect incremental CapEx to be funded roughly 50-50 debt and equity, which includes both external equity and cash flow from operations. Our financing plan design also takes into account the goal of maintaining a strong balance sheet and continuing to meet our long-term debt-to-capital target of less than 60%. Another assumption inherent in our new plan is that we will continue to be a cash taxpayer 
especially as we will likely become subject to the new corporate alternative minimum tax in the coming years. On slide 18, we provide a summary of our continued strong financial condition. Our total debt to capital ratio as of September 30th, net of the roughly $630 million of cash on hand remains at 54%, which is comfortably within our long-term target of less than 60%. As we are all aware, the current higher interest rate environment is challenging. We are, however, in a position of strength on a number of fronts in dealing with the challenge. Our strategy of issuing debt at the holding company level allows us to take advantage of our scale and pricing debt issuances. We remain confident that we will have strong access to capital for the long term. In fact, we just extended the maturity of our revolving credit facility to October 2028, which has a capacity of $2.75 billion. Our diversified banking relationships with some of the largest and strongest banks in the world, coupled with our fully regulated business model and strong credit ratings, gives us great confidence around liquidity. Our laddered approach to long-term debt financings over the years is very important in environments like the current one to manage cash flows and minimize interest rate risk, which contributes to managing customer affordability. And our short duration between general rate cases allows us to minimize any lag we may experience related to recovery of debt costs. With that, I'll turn it back over to Susan for some closing thoughts. Susan? Thanks, John. To close on slide 20, you've heard our our latest strategic thinking today, and it should sound very familiar. It's all about execution at every level. As we continue to demonstrate our ability to consistently execute, we believe our industry-leading EPS and dividend growth combined with our focus on affordability and ESG leadership will continue to be highly valued and rewarded by investors. We believe these aspects of our business and strategy separate, separate us from all utilities. They are underpinned by our significant low-risk capital investment plan, which includes our best-in-class execution on acquisitions and our excellent regulatory execution, all while maintaining a strong balance sheet with a well-planned debt maturity profile and a differentiated affordability proposition. Through our consistent achievement of high operating standards, including our leading safety culture and water quality accolades, our team at American Water has raised the bar for success in the water and wastewater industry. And that includes the outstanding efforts by our military services group team to proudly serve the 18 military installations in our footprint. Our history of executing on our strategies has delivered a very competitive, sustainable shareholder return. With this long-term plan, we have full confidence in our ability to achieve the goals we talked about today and continue our track record of delivering superior shareholder value. And with that, let me turn the call back over to Chris to begin Q&A and take any questions you may have. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star, then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Today's first question comes from Richard Sunderland with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed. Hi, good morning. Am I coming through clearly? You are, Rich. Good morning. Great. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate the details around the update here. I wanted to start with the CapEx revision and the bill outlook. Looking back to 2021 when you first outlined the accelerated investment plan, uh, you, you gave some details on the, the customer affordability angle, you know, but I'm curious, kind of bridging, not back to last year, but back to 21, is, is there anything different in that outlook now? Obviously, CapEx is up significantly. Also curious if the 2% customer additions target in the language around there for M&A has factored into how you've, you've crafted this new capital plan around the customer affordability angle as well. Okay, Rich. Yeah, there's a lot in there. Let me start, um, and then Cheryl and John can add to it. Um, I I would say our focus has sharpened over the last uh, number of years related to customer affordability. And that sharpened focus, I think, has really been around 
um, th this sort of wallet share concept that Cheryl talked about. Um, I think it's important for us, us, us to understand the communities that we operate in and the uh, demographics of those communities and what are the challenges uh, of, of customers in those communities. And we've been able to do a lot of analysis at a very detailed level around affordability, around household income, around you know, just economic impacts in the various communities that we serve. And our, our focus has been, um, uh, I, I think, very clearly defined around our wallet share uh, as a percentage of that household income. And we've been developing this concept here now for a number of years, and I think that um, our ability to, to confidently say this plan, as we've continued to grow it, um, will will continue to maintain our position of roughly 1% or less uh, of a customer's bill uh, in the communities that we serve specifically. And I think that focus has allowed us to really think about, um, you know, how to build this plan, how to continue to grow it, how to continue to grow rate base while not uh, overburdening customers with uh, our growth expectations. I think this plan fits very nicely in that concept. Cheryl, you want to add anything? Yeah, I would just add, Rich, that, you know, as Susan said, we we look at all the communities that we serve. We look at the demographics. And yet the capital investments are not that different from community to community. And we need to make sure that we are investing at the right level in all of those communities. New regulations um, like PFOS, but also the lead and copper rule, that is driving a lot of capital investment across the board. And so we have to continue to do that. And we need to do that in all the communities. So these these affordability calculations, the risk priority model that we use, we think it's really the best balance to getting the right amount of infrastructure investment in all of the communities that we serve. And as we grow the number of communities that we're serving, that will continue to, to increase. Um, but we think we're getting the right balance there because we, we have to treat um, all of our customers in a fair way. They all deserve clean, safe drinking water. And, and, and Cheryl, I might just add one additional comment. From a regulatory perspective, you know, this is also a concept that we've been sharing very transparently with regulators, um, this affordability analysis that we've done. And as we lay out in every jurisdiction the plan and the investments that we have made, we're right alongside it talking about impacts to customers and how we've thought about the plan uh, and, and, and how it affects affordability for the customers in the service territory. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a concept and a, and a view that we've taken uh, that we think is differentiating here, and I think regulators, uh, just as as one party, are certainly recognizing that. And Rich, I'll pick up on the two percent uh, part of your question. As, as Susan mentioned in in her commentary, uh, you know, two percent is is a metric that we think is is good to think about as a long term metric, given just the the short term uh, variability a around acquisitions. But you're right to point it out in this context, as you know, that eight to nine percent rate-based growth is what drives the seven to nine percent earnings growth. But being able to spread that eight to nine percent rate-based growth over a larger customer base is a healthy element of our growth. Great, that, that was very helpful, caller. There, thanks for laying all of that out. And, and then separately, turning to the financing plan here. Um, you're clear on on the drivers around the equity uh, relative to the capex. I'm curious on the operating cash flow side. It looks like a significant step up, uh, 24 to 20 versus 23 to 27. Is is that just normal course kind of rate recovery? Any discrete items in there? Just how to think about prior versus new. Yeah, it's a good question, Rich. R really, there is a big step up if you think about the increase in our capital plan as we go back from you know, 2021, 20, 22, 23, and, and, and forward, it's such a significant step up that when you drop 23 out of the plan and you bring 28 into the plan, uh, the accumulation of the capital spend through that period, it, it, it accounts for a very significant portion of, of that operating cash flow step up. Uh, there, and then as you, as you would also intuitively think, the you know that the, there is increased cash flow in the interim years as well, just given the increase in in, in capital plan. Got it. Got it. Well, thank you for the time today. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Rich. 
Our next question is from Paul Zimbardo with Bank of America. Please proceed. Hi, good morning, team. Good morning. And just to clarify on that last one, confirm my understanding. So there's effectively no change in the kind of the growth triangle, as you call it. It's just kind of a, a representation. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, you know, we, we, we want to continue to emphasize that rate-based growth is the driver. Uh, rate-based investment, which includes acquisitions, is the driver. What we're trying to do here, I think, is just give some clarity around or, or a, maybe a better view as to how you can measure our uh, progress toward uh, growth through acquisition by giving you that sort of metric around uh, customer additions. The the investment that we'll continue to make in acquisitions just rolls into rate base, which it always has. So no real change in that. I, I just think it's a better view potentially for investors uh, to be able to see uh, progress we're making around the acquisition strategy. Okay. Understood. That's what I thought. And then shifting to the financing plan. So if, if I understand it right, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, it doesn't assume any kind of litigation proceeds, state funding, federal funding for PFAS. Uh, just, is there any sense of what that kind of offset could be to help out on customer bills? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, obviously, the numbers that we have laid out here, as Cheryl outlined, uh, continue to be our best estimates of the cost necessary to uh, meet the current proposed rule. Obviously, we don't have a rule yet, so you know, finalizing those numbers uh, will will occur once we have a final rule. And and we do participate in the the uh, ongoing litigation um, around this whole issue. We've laid all that out in the queue, so you can look at that there and and probably won't talk much more about it than that since it is ongoing litigation. Uh, I think it is fair to say that our estimates today are the costs we we would expect to incur. Uh, we have to see how the litigation ultimately works out um, to see what impact that may have. And I think Cheryl covered this well. Um, you know, we do believe as by virtue of our participation in the litigation that polluters, uh, you know, should be our first uh, line here of of responsibility, so we are we are quite uh, involved in that to make sure that that is properly executed. Okay, so, so to make sure, instead, it, it does have an assumption around kind of getting external funding, or it, it does not. It, it does not at this point. No, it's okay. just the cost estimates that we have uh, developed so far. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, great. Now, thank you very much. Sure. The next question comes from Will Granger with Mizuho. Please proceed. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, thanks for taking my question. Just wanted to ask, um, on the PFAS billion dollars that you've outlined today, how should we be thinking about the makeup of that over your service territories? Is it pretty ratable or um, – yeah, if you could unpack the underlying assumptions there, that'd be helpful. Yeah, I'll ask Cheryl to comment on that. Uh, we, we hit on it, I think, pretty high level, but Cheryl, you might want to just reemphasize that. Yeah, we um, as we've looked at this, our, um, as I mentioned in my comments earlier, we expect the bulk of the spend to be in our states where we have a larger footprint of customers, New Jersey, for example. And, and the reason for that driver of that being the largest amount of spend is that there's more contamination there in general, but also these are large surface water plants that are very costly to add treatment to. Um, you know, we, we have um, Pennsylvania as a larger state, numerous locations there, but but we really haven't outlined everywhere that, that we're going to add treatment, but anywhere that it's a surface water plant as opposed to a groundwater source, it's gonna be a lot more costly to add that treatment. And so, so New Jersey's our biggest dollar state for sure. Got it. That's helpful. And then may, maybe just on the equity for your plan, um, is that the incremental equity is, is just seven hundred million, if I've got my math right? The three hundred that you're still you're planning to issue now, and then an incremental seven hundred million, or is it an incremental billion? You've got it right, Will. It's an incremental seven hundred million. Okay, and. We, we should expect the timing of that to come in um, towards the back half of 
of your plan, or would that be issued like as, as an ATM and just kind of pretty ratable? Uh, what we've said is we'll issue it uh, in in the middle uh, of our new 2024 to 2028 plan, uh, su subject to market conditions, obviously. Got it. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for the time. Well, our next question is from Jonathan Reeder with Wells Fargo. Please proceed. Hey, good morning, team. Uh, just kind of following up a little bit. On that last question, you know, despite the higher operating cash flows, it looks like, you know, the external capital needs increased more than the $2 billion CapEx increase. You know, you got the uh, $700 million of equity, and then I think it's $1.7 billion of debt. Anything uh, unique going on there? No, Jonathan. You know, we really lead this analysis by, uh, by looking at our credit metrics. Uh, and, and so a lot of it just goes back to what we've said in the past, where incremental capex will fund it 50-50 debt and equity. And as we think about equity, there it's you know it's internally generated funds as well as as well as new issuance. Uh, so it's it, it um, I, you know I think we, we we think of it as lining up in that regard. Okay, no, I was just thinking the the debt portion was a little higher than I would have thought. Yeah, that, that's just a function of of the capital spend as well as the, the maturity schedule. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe the maturity schedule. Okay. Um, so, Cheryl, I know you said that California filed uh, on 1016 to increase the 24 allowed ROE. Um, has there been any opposition filed to this request? I think there's like a 30 day uh, comment period, which probably ended maybe yesterday. Yeah, there is that 30 day period. And, and um, Jonathan, I am unaware of any kind of um, intervention or any kind of um, concern over that. Okay. It's pretty formulaic, Jonathan. Yeah. I mean, it. it um, uh, yeah, we don't expect there to be any issue with that. It, it really just follows a formula. Yeah, no, I mean, I think investor concern is more on the electric side, whether you see some intervention uh, than the water, but uh, we can monitor both. Um, I think uh, the 10 year CapEx plan, you bumped up the M&A placeholder by a billion. Is there anything specific driving that or is that just, uh, you know, kind of passage of time more than anything? Yeah, I'd say, Jonathan, it's the, certainly passage of time is part of it. We are investing in our capability across the system, uh, starting with originations and as well as due diligence and, and integrations. You know, as, as we look at what happens when we make acquisitions and just our, our 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 standards as a best in class operator relative to the to the to the systems that we acquire we we just continue to think that uh, that there's a, a lot of momentum there and a lot of strength in us us continuing this program so it it, it is a capability that we're investing significantly in uh, uh and 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 yes as you pointed out as we move forward in time we expect those numbers to be, to become bigger to to, to, to maintain that relative level of contribution. Okay. And then last, you mentioned the, the pension costs for 24 and, and, you know, figuring that out. But do you have much exposure on that, or do most of your key states now have tracking mechanisms uh, for pension? We, we have trackers and, and deferral accounts in certain states, Jonathan, and we can go through that with you uh, in, in, in detail. Uh, so that there, there's a mix there of, of what we pick up already and what would need to be picked up in the future. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks for taking my questions this morning. Thanks. As a reminder, if you do have a question, please press star then one. The next question comes from Greg Oral with UBS. Please proceed. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Um, good morning, Greg. Good morning. Um, I think you mentioned uh, you're working on an acquisition in Pennsylvania of um, $104 million to close in late 24, 25. Um, how, do you, how do you think about, you know, when you go into acquisitions, sort of the reasonable um, timeline for, for getting approvals? Um, how do you think about that? John, you want to comment on that? I, I think the one you're referring to in particular, it's a little more complicated. I, I wouldn't say it's sort of a, a, a traditional uh, 
process, this, the town mints and actu- a- acquisition. And recall, we we stepped into uh, that arrangement when uh, NextEra decided to exit uh, the opportunity. So that was just a little more complicated. But John, you want to talk sort of typically how we think about the process around sure. acquisitions? Sure. Yeah, and and Greg, it varies state to state. But since you mentioned Pennsylvania, you know, there's a process you go through to file an application. The application has to be deemed complete. And then that starts a statutory clock. And so in the case of Pennsylvania, there's a six month statutory clock uh, that that runs through. And then either you're 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 settling your approval or you're litigating your approval, but all within that six month statutory timetable. And so what's different about this situation? Well, Tom Minson is one where uh, there's. there's opportunity based on precedent in Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll, we'll see how the uh, the post PUC approval plays out, uh, but we're just allowing a little bit of latitude in the event that, uh, that there's uh, any any follow up to the PUC approval from from interveners. Okay, thanks. The next question comes from Aditya Gandhi with Wolf Research. Please proceed. Good morning, Susan, Cheryl, and John. Can you can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, I just wanted to start on PFAS and uh, curious to to hear your latest thoughts around two specific topics. Um, how are you thinking about the, the protection of water systems from any PFAS-related financial liability under CERCLA? Um, you know, do, do you see risk if a final rule is released and it doesn't contain any protections? Um, and, and then the, the second topic is, can you, can you maybe give some color on what portion of the 50 million additional annual O&M sort of qualifies for, for uh, you know, trackers or, or expense mechanisms? I can take those questions. This is Cheryl. Um, as far as protections around the circula, CERCLA, we have been really engaged in that process, and we have been pushing really hard to ensure that water and wastewater utilities are protected in that in that space. And so we're going to continue to fight that battle. Uh, right now, you're right, there is a little bit of vulnerability out there, but but we feel pretty confident that we're going to be able to manage through that and that we're going to be able to impact um, how we're treated in that space. So more to come on that, but rest assured, we are going to fight like crazy to make sure that that we are protected there. And as far as the 50 million, um, I don't have an exact breakdown, and we haven't talked about an exact breakdown from state to state, but whether or not that would be recovered through mechanisms just depends on the type of mechanisms that a state would have. So if they have um, a, a mechanism that would allow them to recover their production costs, any any kind of tracker in that space would be really helpful in those costs. In some cases, we have environmental riders that include capital improvements. Some of them include capital and operating improvements. So that would allow them to to um, recover those costs as well. So you know, there's going to be a portion that we're going to be able to recover right up front, but the rest of them will just recover through a general rate case with very little um, lag. I would anticipate as far as those costs are concerned. Yeah, and the only thing I would add, uh, add you to that is uh, where we don't have an existing mechanism or a, uh, an approach to uh, ensure timely recovery, we're going to work to uh, design one. Um, you know, our view here is that these are federally mandated costs, um, and we are taking care of a problem created by someone else. Uh, and because of that federal mandate and, and the federal rule behind it, we think we'll have uh, a great argument to make around recovery and timely recovery. So we'll be looking for where we don't have existing solutions. We'll be looking to create a um, uh, new opportunity to do that. So, you know, there'll be a lot on the regulatory front here to do once we have a final rule and um, uh, know how this plays out. Yes, yeah, Susan, I would just add that that three-year implementation period yeah. that we have to put treatment in place gives us time to do those kinds of things and make those regulatory improvements. Right. Got it. That, that's super helpful, color. Thank you. And and one, just one question for John. Um, 
on the on the equity needs, you, you mentioned it's in the middle of your uh, new 24 through 28 plan, so sort of in the 26 time frame. Um, you, you're also you're also going to have proceeds from the HOS note come in. I, I believe they're due at the end of 2026. Just just can you add a little bit more color on on timing and the form of equity? Is this just going to be like a like a straight block, or is this going to be some sort of forward where you'll you know um, you'll, you'll maybe draw down on the forward or, or over a couple of years. How should we think about that? Yeah, D yeah, I would say that we haven't, uh, we're, we're not close enough yet in terms of time to have made the decision on the uh, on the exact form of equity. You're, you're right on uh, the timing of the HOS note proceeds, but as, as we approach uh, the, the the more immediate timing, then we'll 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 develop our thinking closer to that point, but certainly we're, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll look and, and do what's best for shareholders there. You know, I'd say that, you know, you've, you've seen us issue, issue the straight equity as we did this year with the $1.7 billion. Uh, we issued the convert this year for, for a billion dollars. And, and so we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're willing to look at everything. Uh, but, but I, I'd say that's, that's a decision we'll make as, as, as that time approaches. Okay, got it. And, and just one one follow up. Um, can you can you just clarify? Um, can, can you just clarify your the, the point you made on your cash taxpayer status? And um, I, I just wanted to confirm: is there a base for your 79% EPS CAGR um, at, at all? I, I can find that in the slides or the the earnings release. Yeah. So, and and, and let me just clarify that you, on the equity uh, that, that we've talked about. To to, to be clear, it, it will be equity. Uh, there, n n not not an, an, another uh, instrument that, to to replace the equity. With with, with regards to our our uh, cash taxpayer status, uh, w with the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we, we do expect that we'll become subject to the corporate alternative minimum tax in the coming years. Th those regulations are not finalized at this point, uh, and, and there are uh, certain elements that are in play that will dictate the precise timing uh, for, for when we uh, would, would become subject to the, the AMT, uh, but, but we are expecting that, that to be the case for us. Uh, with, with regards to the, uh, to, to the, to the 7 and to 9 percent in, in a base year, you know, I'd say on that, you know, th th this is a target that we think of as a long-term target. You're uh, aware that over the last few years, we, we reset the capital plan with the sale of HOS and the sale of New York, uh, and we, we needed uh, time to redeploy those proceeds, and which was the case in, in, in 22 and in, in 23. And as Susan pointed out, our, our 24 guidance reflects an 8% uh, EPS uh, CAGR at, at, at the midpoint. Um, so we really think of seven to nine as a, as a, as a long-term Target driven by the long-term uh, eight to nine percent rate-based growth, Kager. Got it. Got it. That's super helpful. Th thanks for thanks for taking all my questions. At this time, we are showing no further questioners in the queue, and this does conclude our question and answer session as well as our conference. Thank you for attending today's presentation, and you may now 